Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How's everyone doing? I hope everyone's doing well. You're not going to be able to uh, turn on your mic. So I'm wondering if someone could type in the chat just to let me know whether you can hear me. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for letting letting me know. I'm going to wait a couple of minutes and then we're going to get started. Just maybe like a minute or so, and then we can get started. Thank you so much to everyone who's who's who signed in. I really do appreciate um, people showing up. Okay. Let's see. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Maybe what I'll do is I will start. Uh, we'll get going um, at any point. So, um, hey JP, how's it going, buddy? Uh, so uh, I'm about to start. A, a, I'm going to share a presentation. Normally, I do this with one of our clinicians. Uh, today, I, I didn't ask any clinician to sort of uh, join me, so I, I'm on my own. And so um, I'm going to try and see how it works with the chat and navigating the chat in the Q&A. Um, I will try to leave some time for us to have some some questions uh, that I can address at the end. And just one thing I want to point out with Teams webinar, um, when you um, are running the webinar, I hear a ding every time someone uh, comes into the lobby. Last when I've done webinars in the past, uh, people in the audience have told me they don't hear it. But if you ever see me stutter or like sort of pause, it's because the ding can some sometimes throw me off in the middle of a, of a thought. So I do I do just wanted to share that with you. I'm going to try and share something uh, uh, presentate my presentation and see whether I can if you guys can see it. OK, um, give me one sec. So let's do present. Oh, I see here. OK, I see. OK, yeah, so I can do that. Can you? Um, Again in the chat, can you let me know if you can see a slides? Yes, okay. The interesting thing is that I do not see it. Oh no, there it is, okay. <laughs> it's gonna be interesting, it's gonna be fun. Um, okay, let's see if we can do this. Um, Okay. Okay. Let's see if we can do this. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, you know what? Well, let's get started. So, thank you so much, everyone, for for joining this evening. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how we can help to uh, instill self-regulation in our children. And and you're going to notice that my main ta uh, point of today's conversation is going to be parents. Okay, so you are my emphasis. You are who I emphasize in terms of who we're working with. It is going to be uh, parents. And so this is going to be much harder. I should have asked somebody to be here. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Um, stop sharing again. One last, I'm going to do one last question in the q and A. I I'm in the chat before I, I, I continue. Um, JP, maybe I'll ask you because you're you're in the audience. Um, when I was able, when I switched out of the full screen, did you see me switch out of the full screen, or the was the presentation still there? Okay, okay. Let's just get going. I'm gonna get going, and then we'll. Um... So, oh, sorry, I scared the wrong screen. <laughs> uh, let's do here. Okay, let's just get going. Uh, window, uh, here we go. Okay, so let us go with presentation, presentation. Okay, so a couple of things that you're gonna notice right away, and that is that you, the cameras are gonna remain off, okay? And also uh, your microphones are gonna remain off. Um, I will be asking you to, uh, if you have any questions or any comments, you can put those in the chat or the Q&A. I will try to get to those uh, by the end uh, of today's uh, talk. Um, so I do appreciate you using the chat or um, the Q&A, okay? Um, so a couple other things I wanna just point out is, let's talk about what we're going to be discussing today. Um, 
I'm going to start off today's conversation trying to propose a slightly different way of looking at things like anxiety or even distress in our children. And you're going to see that I'm going to emphasize something different than we tend to hear in society. We're then going to move on into talking about what is self-regulation and what should you keep in mind as a, as a parent. We're going to talk a little bit about behaviors, trying to understand our children's behaviors. And then we're going to talk about how we can take practical, small incremental uh, steps to, towards meaningful engagement. Um, and so let's talk about who I am. You're probably wondering who is this 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 person. So my name is Dr. Ed Rolden. I am the one of the clinical directors uh, at, at our clinic. So we originally started as my sister and I were the two directors. Originally, we were Etobicoke Psychological Services. We started in Etobicoke. We then uh, just over two years ago, we start we opened up a clinic in Vaughan. We call EPS Family Health. It's at Highway 7 in Pine Valley. And I am a, a clinical and school psychologist and I work with children of all ages, young adults and parents. Um, I worked in the school system for 10 years and before transitioning to private practice. I'm also a consulting psychologist for the George Hall Center, which is the agency for mental health in children in a topical area. And I also uh, I supervise quite a bit and I used to be part of the, uh, the supervision team at uh, UFT's uh, uh, residency consortium. Um, so just you're, in case you're wondering, like, who, who am I coming to, to hear today? Um, that's who I am. Um, a couple of things before before I even get to the disclaimer, I wanted to start off by thanking individually thanking uh, Mr. Gelozzi, uh, who I th believe is the JP that I'm talking. I'm hoping it's the JP that I'm talking to. Mr. Gelozzi and I are friends for many years, um, and he's a principal at uh, St. Joseph, I believe, in Richmond Hill. And so I'm very appreciative of, of for his efforts in helping me to set up this talk. I have literally been trying for two years to try to to present, have a free presentation for parents at the York Catholic Board, and, and it's taken me two years to get it approved. So uh, Mr. Gelosi has been very instrumental in that process. And I also wanna thank the board for, for being able to share my link. Uh, I'm very grateful for, for, for that. Uh, and so th thank you, uh, JP, and thank you to the board. Um, one thing I want to point out, today's conversation, I'm, I, I'm not providing psychological services. What I mean is that I'm not going to be able to talk about specific cases or situations. I will be talking about broad topics. I will be trying to give you resources and information and trying to get you to think in maybe a slightly different way than we normally think about certain scenarios or situations. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my main focus is the audience. It is parents. It is not necessarily going to be talking about what we can do specifically uh, or what we can ask our children to do. It is what we can do as parents to help to instill or, or help to develop our children's self-regulation skills. And so my hope is to do what we call cultivate awareness. It is planting seeds of awareness and one of the things you're going to hear me come back to is this idea of one degree change. And so the one degree change is an analogy. Um, you probably some of you have heard of it. So it, the, the one degree change is this. Imagine that you're on a huge cruise ship, um, a massive cruise ship, and the captain decides to change the trajectory of the ship by one degree. Such a small change uh, wouldn't be felt by passengers. So you, as somebody who's on the cruise ship, you wouldn't notice if the captain has changed the direction by one degree. However, if you take the trajectory of the sh original uh, uh, direction that the ship was going and compare it to where the ship ends up, just by making one degree change over long distance, you end up with a boat that is in completely two different complete spots. It is it is vastly different just by doing one degree change. And so one of the things I'm going to keep going coming back to is when we are overwhelmed by all the things that are on our plate, I want I always have to try to emphasize with parents, we're thinking about how we can do one small thing that will lead to uh, meaningful uh, change down the road. Um, Another thing I want to mention about today's talk is literally every well, there's different sections of the talk. I can have full day conversations about each topic. And so sometimes you might just get a little bit of information. Um, and again, if you want to reach out to me later about trying to set up some free talks at your schools, I, I would I would love to maybe go into more detail on some of the topics that that uh, uh, I will I will talk about today. OK, so let's start with I, I said to you that one of the first things I'm going to try to propose to you is can we look at anxiety in a slightly different way? One of the most common calls that we get at the clinic is can you cure basically my child's anxiety? Can you help 
to um, sort of, can you uh, help my child to not be anxious? It is the most common call we get. Or can you help my child cope with anxiety? And I want to propose a slightly different way of thinking uh, about anxiety, but we can also it, uh, th apply this th thinking to things like distress. And so I, I say I write trigger warning. So if you're uh, afraid of any sort of you know critters, there's going to be one on the next slide. So please look away or close your eyes. I, I should point out also one other thing. If you're in the audience and you've seen me talk before, you probably will see some analogies that I've, I've used before, and I use them because they're so powerful and so helpful. Um, so I am going to turn the, the to the next slide. So if you're afraid of critters, please look away. But let's look at this friend over here. Um, I'm curious. You guys see this? Some thoughts, like any reactions from the audience in terms of, uh, you know, what you think when you see this this help this critter on on your screen? Sure, I'm going to be able to see the chat. But, anyways, let's let me use this. I want to use an analogy to try to explain this idea of why I'm showing you a tarantula. Imagine that we were all in one big room. And imagine that while we're in one big room, someone came in and dropped tarantulas on onto the floor. And let's say that I'm hoping that no one like or that people don't love tarantulas. If you love tarantulas, just think of something else that you don't love. Um, imagine that someone drops tarantulas on the floor. I want you to think about um, how would you react to tarantulas in the room with you? And there's a couple of caveats. We can't kill a tarantula and we can't get rid of the tarantula. What would you do in the room that where tarantulas were crawling on the floor? I'm curious. You can throw in the chat. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to see them, but throw some ideas in the chat. How would you respond to seeing tarantulas being in the same room uh, with a tarantula? I'm going to tell you two things that happens when the tarantula is in the same room as us. First, our attention is going to be drawn to the tarantula. We're all going to be looking to make sure we know where the tarantulas are. Second thing, thing that's going to happen is that our behavioral choices are going to be controlled by that tarantula. If it goes to one corner, we're going to move to an opposite corner. If it, we're constantly going to be looking for where the tarantula is, shifting away from the tarantula, and we're going to forget why we were in the room. We're going to be looking for exit points, looking at the tarantula and moving away. In this example, the tarantula is much like anxiety. When we have anxiety in our lives, it takes all of our attention, all of our focus, and it starts to dictate our behavior. And so this is why I'm using this analogy, because we often treat anxiety like a tarantula. We focus on it and we look to avoid. Unfortunately, I have good news and bad news. The good news or the bad news is that I cannot get rid of everyone's tarantula. And the reason is, is if, if you think of anything that's important to you, your brain, you know, uh, will throw worries about that thing that you care about. So, for example, I have two boys, 10 year old, seven year old. You better believe that when I'm at work, there are times when randomly my brain decides to throw something at me like, are you sure Marcus is safe? Are you sure Oscar is OK? Are you sure your wife got home from work? And these thoughts will come into my thought randomly. Why? Because those people are important to me. And so one of the things I want you to think about is when we care about things, we are going to be anxious. And so that's why I'm saying to you, one of the things I can I cannot say to you is I'm going to get rid of tarantulas for you. However, one of my my emphasis is going to be imagine that we're all in the same room. Tarantulas are dropped into the room. What we're going to work on is noticing that the tarantula is in the room, noticing our reaction that we feel gross and it's scary. We're going to notice our thoughts of, like, oh, my God, there's a tarantula. Oh, my God, there's a tarantula. And then we're going to teach ourselves how to shift our attention to meaningful action within the room. To remember why we were in the room in the first place so that we can engage in meaningful action, even though there are tarantulas that make us uncomfortable in the room. And so this is already one of the things I want you to think about as we go to the next slide. It's going to be one of the, the first seed of awareness that I'm trying to cultivate. One of the things I'm hoping to sort of start to, you know, get you guys thinking about is can we shift 
from a place of trying to solve or get rid of anxiety or distress because in some in in inadvertently what we're doing is getting in the way of resilience building and so i want you to think about that so if we care about things we're going to be worried about them at times how can we engage in meaningful behavioral engagement even though there might be tarantulas in the room with us and we're going to talk about that a little bit today Shifting now to self-regulation, which is the main topic of today's conversation, and I hope it's, you know, uh, as you know, as you heard earlier, today I'm going to be talking to you as parents. How do we help our children to develop self-regulation? So self-regulation basically refers to the ability to manage one's thoughts, emotions, and behaviors to achieve personal goals and adapt to different situations. There's going to be skills within self-regulation. Everything from managing impulses, right? So how do we delay gratification, for example? How do we regulate our emotions? And can we set goals? Can we monitor our progress? And can we adapt and be flexible given different scenarios? Okay, so those are all going to be part of self-regulation. But before we get there, let's talk, or actually, let's look at some examples of what self-regulation might look like. And I think this is really important because sometimes not thinking about the developmental stage of your child can be the reason why you think there may be issues or concerns. OK, and so when you have a child who's in kindergarten, self-regulation is going to look like can they follow simple instructions? Can they transition between activities? Can are they starting to show things like sharing or taking turns? OK, as you get into grades one and two, self-regulation is going to look at like can they persist on tasks? Can they start? to regulate emotion. And we're really talking about identifying emotions at this stage, identifying what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. Can you start with some preliminary problem solving? And can they start to understand that they have to manage their time at times, like having to shift or shift from one activity to another? As we get into grades three and five, we're now looking at things. Can they start to monitor their own progress? Can they start to, to follow some organizational system? Are they completing homework? Are they setting goals? And are they controlling some of their impulses? And then as we get to grade six and eight, we're getting into time management, critical thinking, study skills. Can they evaluate their progress? Can they start to develop? And it, this can happen earlier, but we're really working on empathy and social skills as well as we get, get into grade six and eight. So what are some things that we can do to help develop self-regulation in our children? Well, one of the first things I'm going to talk about to you guys uh, tonight is this. And, and it's funny because people sometimes don't get this concept, but all behavior makes sense within the context in which it occurs. I'm going to repeat it. All behavior makes sense within the context in which it, occur, it, it, it occurs. I say this to you because oftentimes we might be perplexed by our child's behavior. We might not understand why a child is behaving a certain way. And to me, what that tells us is that we don't know the full context. We don't actually know what was driving the behavior uh, that that result that the, the child displayed. And the reason is this, is because behavior is often done to meet a need. When a child engages in certain behavior, they're trying to get a need met. And sometimes what we're seeing is a child who has no other way to actually express their needs other than through problematic behaviors. And so one of the first things I'm going to ask you to think about when you're, you're thinking of your own ind individual children, or if you're an educator, when you're thinking about the children at your school, is when a child behaves in a certain way, what is it that they're trying to communicate? What is it that they're trying to achieve through their behavior? One of the things that we often don't think about is that what you may be seeing is an inability to handle the scenario in which they find themselves in. So in, in essence, what you might be seeing is a skill deficit, meaning that the scenario that the child finds find themselves in supersedes their ability to cope. And so sometimes when we think that children are being purposeful, like he's choosing to misbehave, he's choosing to not follow instructions, he's choosing to throw the his toy at his sister, in reality is, is actually telling you that that child cannot handle whatever frustration, disappointment, embarrassment, shame that might be coming up in response to the scenario. 
And so in order to hammer that that concept, um, I want to I'm going to jump right down to the five million dollar analogy. Again, I can't unfortunately I can't see the chat, but I'm going to pose a question and again, maybe you can raise hands or or you could respond in, in the chat. I'm curious if I said to you that EPS has has um, you know, won the, the all this money from from the government and we, we have five million dollars to give to any family, five million dollars. I'm curious how many of you would be interested in getting the five million dollars? I'm going to wait. I'm going to pretend that I can see the chat or the responses, but just how many of you would want $5 million? No, no real strings attached. Think about it. I imagine that some of you are like, yeah, a hundred percent. Now, what if I said to you, okay, I have $5 million. You've been selected as a potential person to get the $5 million. Um, the only thing you need to do to, to get the $5 million is I want you to learn, you know, for me, it might be something like to learn Japanese by Monday. I want you to think of a language that is not linked to any language that you know, and, I, and that's what you would have to learn by Monday. So imagine someone said to me, Ed, you're gonna, we're going to give you $5 million if you can learn Japanese fluently, write it, read it uh, by Monday. Come Monday, I go pick up you know, the $5 million, I show up, and let's say they give me a test to, in, to see how I speak Japanese. Guess what's going to happen? I'm not going to get my $5 million. And someone might say to me, well, I guess you weren't motivated, huh? You didn't really want that $5 million. You didn't try hard enough. And yet the reality is, is that the ask was too high. So think about that. Sometimes we need to think about whether we're expecting something from our children that goes beyond their capacity to handle. They might not have the skill to do what you're asking of them. And so I, I use that analogy for us to think a little bit about when you see a, a behavior that keeps happening, we might need to think about how we teach the skill that might be missing. If they're having big emotions, how do we start doing emotion regulation? If they have trouble using their words properly, how do we start working on communication? If they're uh, being getting frustrated very easily and going from zero to 100, how do we start to instill frustration tolerance? OK, and so oftentimes, you know, again, I said this earlier, when we see misbehavior, we see it as purposeful. And the reality is that it's not always a choice. Therefore, punishing a behavior may not help to reduce a problem. Right. If someone said to me, you know, you didn't get your five million dollars for for, you know, you didn't work hard enough to learn Japanese by Monday and they give me a punishment. And then they give me a second chance to learn another language now in, in three days. The punishment isn't all of a sudden going to make me work hard enough to learn that language. So remember that punishment isn't necessarily going to make up for a skill deficit. And so one thing that's important, I'll, I'll pause here a little bit to, to say one other thing. One of the best ways to notice if a, a consequence is helpful is whether it changes behavior. If you find yourself doing the same, giving the same punishment and the same consequence, and it's not changing behavior, then either you're not using a punishment that matters enough for the child, or realistically, you're trying to punish away a skill deficit. Okay, so I want you to just think about that a little bit. Now, you know, I think it goes without saying. So if we if we start to notice that a skill is an actual deficit, or if there's a skill deficit, then we need to sort of teach it. Right. And so if you have a young child who's having big emotions, you'll you'll notice and you'll see the some of the resources I give you at the end, free resources that I give you at the end of the conversation or today's conversation is going to be about how we can be emotion coaches for our children. And oftentimes for emotion regulation, you're literally starting with noticing and labeling. Hey, I can tell you're angry. You know, I can really tell you're angry. I can tell because you're you're making that face and you're getting all tense and your 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 fists are all balled up. I can see you're angry. So what have I done there? I've no I've got I've worked on my child to notice what I'm seeing. I'm telling them what I see, and I'm labeling it for them. I, I think you're you you look angry, and what I am doing is I am scaffolding, so that later on the child is starting to to listen to the language I'm providing so that they can start to incorporate into their own vocabulary. Okay. One of the things, other things that's going to come up in our, in our, you know, that I will emphasize is we are the best teachers for how our children act. Right. And so how we manage stress, stressful situations, disappointments, changes in schedule, 
um, chaos can be the best model for how our children are going to handle the similar scenarios. OK. Um, and so you'll see that at a certain point um, when we're talking about self-regulation, we have to remember that for younger children, self-regulation actually refers to co-regulation. With younger children, you have a child in kindergarten who's upset. We're labeling it and then we're giving hugs and saying, yeah, you're upset and you're angry. You know, why don't we come sit with daddy and we'll we'll sort of take some deep breaths together and we'll work on it together. So we're co-regulating. We're helping our children by modeling and by helping them and guiding and scaffolding to be able to start to instill skills. The other thing that you're, you're going to notice um, is we're going to talk about, you know, again, some of the resources that I give you is about validating. Uh, validating emotions, and you'll hear me say this over and over, I'll say this later on, when we teach validation to parents, which can be very challenging at times, and people can find it a little bit confusing, when we're validating, what we're saying is, how do we teach, how do we help parents to say yes to emotional responses, but not necessarily yes to behavioral outcomes? So, for example, if my if my son were to throw something at my at his younger brother, I would never validate and say it's OK the, to the you know that he threw something at his brother, but I would validate the anger and frustration. So I might say something like, hey, bud, I can tell you you're, you're annoyed and frustrated because your brother's always on your case and because he's he's always you know in getting into your business and because he doesn't stop. I get that. And so I'm validating that. I understand that I, I get frustrated, too, at times. And you know we're not allowed to throw anything at each other. And so this is the consequence. So we're validating the emotion, saying yes to the emotion, but not necessarily saying yes to the behavior. And we can still provide consequences and and, and sort of, um, you know, give give those results to, to the child, even though we're validating the emotion. The other thing I, I just put in as a last point here is that when you think about things like um, frustration tolerance or even patience, we're living in a society where kids are used to getting things like this, right? They're used to, oh, I opened, they, they don't they don't know what commercials are, right? <laughs> they don't know, they start to get annoyed when there's an ad on YouTube, right? And so one of the things that we can think about is how can we as parents start to instill a sense of waiting? Because that is a skill that they're going to be using when they get older. And we might do that by simply saying, okay, cool, you're going to get that in two minutes. And you can even put a timer, put a visual there, and they can do two minutes. Okay, cool, now you can go. Right. It's you're helping to instill the ability to to hope to wait and not get their needs met immediately. Um, a, a couple of things I just want to do to validate you as parents, because I think it's important, you know, when I work with parents, one of the very first things I do at the beginning of our sessions is I really try to explain that. Whenever I try to work with parents, it comes from a place of compassion and understanding. And the reason is this. You better believe that even though, so my wife is a, is a kindergarten teacher actually in the board, in the in your Catholic board. Um, you know, she's a kindergarten teacher. Patience till, you know, till the day, you know, it, it's amazing patience. I'm a child, mostly a child psychologist. You better believe that both of us, no matter the skill sets that we have, make mistakes there will be times will we where we are going to fail so to speak in a scenario or in a situation okay so i say that because it is important when you are looking at your parenting that we're not doing it from a lens of criticism and saying that you should do better it is about like what can we take from these scenarios and what can we adjust one degree change so that we improve outcomes and I say that to you because one of the things it, that I wanted to mention is that if you start to notice that your child is does have a skill deficit, that doesn't make it not annoying. It could still be annoying. You could still feel frustrated as a parent when you start to realize, oh, my God, they can't handle that. They don't know how to do that. There might be some understanding, but you, you're human. You can also be a little bit annoyed or frustrated. In those moments, we still want to think about models, modeling self-regulation. We want to val we still validate emotions, even though we might be frust frustrated, and we want to acknowledge any pro-social things they're doing. I really like how you ask for help. You know, I, you know, I liked how you try to remove yourself from the scenario. So we are trying to be specific with our praise for the things that your child did well. Okay. So seed number two. When we st start to think about the why behind our children's behavior, 
it can help help us to understand how we're going to respond. And so in some ways we're doing validation. I understand why you feel frustrated, angry, whatever it is. Um, and you also know that you can't do these things and these are the consequences. And all of this is to try to develop a more mindful approach to our parenting. You know, you hear the word mindfulness all the time. When I talk about mindful parents, parenting, I'm not talking about like sitting there and looking at the clouds. What I'm talking about when I when I mentioned mindful parenting is if I can, you know, stop you in any given moment and I pause and I get you to pause and I, I tap you on the shoulder and I ask you, what is behind your choice right now as a parent? What is driving your de your decision making right now in this moment? Can you start to listen to what it is that's driving your decisions? Because oftentimes what we're really responding to is our own internal discomfort. So if you see your child in distress and you're looking to save, really you're saving them because you can't stand seeing them in discomfort. Or sometimes we might give, be giving consequences because we're frustrated or annoyed. And so if we're able to start to develop, and again, it's not about perfection. You might only be able to do this one out of 10 times. But if you can stop at any, you know, one out of 10 times to notice and say, why am I about to give this consequence? Or why am I about to act this way as a parent? I'm hoping that by engaging in one degree change, we might start to notice small things that we can do in those, in those scenarios. Okay, I'm gonna. This is this next little section is gonna be for parents of older children. Uh, these are grade six to eight idea. The idea is to, to for kids who are in grade six to eight. And the reason is is I think that the self regulation component there's a so uh, some added variables that make self regulation more challenging at that eight uh, within that age range. And what I'm really referring to is basically media. Okay, um, so in my dissertation, when I was doing my PhD, my dissertation was on the impact of media and how we tend to compare ourselves to others. Okay, and this is really important, particularly in the reason I did grade six is because I think with technology, it's becoming much more common for kids in grade six and even who knows even younger to have cell phones. And when you have cell phones and you have access to social media, what we're we're not always aware of is that what we're doing is we're providing our children with a source of constant comparisons. Um, and I think that this is really prevalent in today's society where you have these influencers, right? Who are showing the best uh, lives like cars, uh, whatever they're doing, traveling. And, and just so you guys know, um, this is important because as kids get older, if you look at the literature on the impact of, of how children make decisions or what they deem to be important, there is a transition as they get older. It used to be when I was doing my dissertation, we were talking about high school age, whereas you get into high school, kids start to care more about what their peers think think than what their family thinks. And I think with media, you're starting to see this happen younger. Okay, so I want you to really think about that. As we're giving devices and social media to our younger children, they're getting more access to nonstop communication with other individuals. And oftentimes the messages that they're hearing is that they're not good enough, that they can't compare with that guy who's flying on a private jet, that they can't compare with this person who is eating at this restaurant and has, has you know has this thing in their house. So I want you to think about that. OK, so so it's really important for us to be conscious of what our children are consuming when they're when they're engaging in, in, in technology. So what are some things that we can do? You've, you've heard all these and it's actually I didn't include. Uh, I don't think I included this link um, at the end of the presentation, but I can include it in a follow up email. And there is a Media Smarts is a great website, Media Smarts. Um, there's a great website that will help parents to develop strategies for technology use and one of the things that i really like about what they what they've developed is there's something called um a green diet and the idea is imagine like you look at food calories and you say okay i can get this much calories from eating a healthy meal and then i can get some calories by eating ice cream and the idea is that we can't you know those calories don't count the same and so the idea is when you're consuming media can we equalize the amount of time you're spending outside or doing active things? And so if you're going to play on your computer, how do we get you to do productive things? And how do we equal those things? And so I, Media Smarts is a great website for you to look at some strategies there. But I, I would, again, emphasize for older kids, we're increasing supervision when they're using technology. We're reducing access to social media. 
We're putting limits on how much they can access and we're having consequences if they're not following the rules. Something I don't have in the presentation, but I say when I work with parents, remember that when we're doing consequences, one of the biggest mistakes that we all make is we threaten consequences. And sometimes those threats are unrealistic, so we're never gonna follow through and we're inconsistent with how we follow through. Just remember that as, if we're gonna do a one degree change in terms of being more mindful as a parent, if you're providing a consequence, I want you to really think about, am I willing to proceed with that consequence? Um, and if so, and I, the child doesn't do what I'm asking, I'm going to follow through with the consequence. Okay, so those are some things I want you to think about. Um, we also wanna be working on giving our, our children grade six to eight other reasons for belonging and meaning and engagement. We want them to be part of community groups, uh, uh, arts, sports, any, music, anything that we can um, so that they're not only engaging in technology, especially in the evenings. Um, and we want to sort of promote open communication. We want to teach assertiveness so they can say no to people. Right. How do we how do we teach children to start to say no? And we provide guidance in this on decision making because our children are going to face some scenarios. Uh, that are going to be sort of challenging for them. And so we, as, as parents, um, can help to guide their decision-making process. Another thing that I, and I, I think this is a really important message for any like educators out there or, or principals is, and I know they do this in the curriculum, but we definitely want to spend some time explicitly teaching media literacy. And the reason is that, you know, when I work with a child, for example, who's playing a lot of video games. Now, I'll, full disclosure, I play video games and I love video games. And yet one of the things that I can work with with a teen is, or a, a child who's playing video games is starting to educate them on how they are being manipulated by, by technology. Right? We are all manipulated by technology. Technology companies have created these programs in such a way that we always want more. Right. We always want more, but there's this and I get this point and I get this, but I'm about to earn this and I'm about to do this. Mom, I'm just been give me five more minutes. I'm about to finish this game. Right. It's it's embedded within the the how they're designed. And so just getting to educate our children to start to to recognize that is really important. OK, um, and we also want to start to develop some independent skills. Can they put limits on themselves? Can they recognize that it's time to get off? Can we start to reward them for and reward might be like high five, might be extra 10 minutes of uh, family time. It doesn't have to be you're buying them something, but can we promote them being more independent with their use of technology? And again, I, I really want to emphasize this, that I, th I think it is more beneficial for you to look at as a collaboration versus like a dictatorship. Um, I think that there's room for sometimes to be very sort of specific, but I think it can backfire because if you are very sort of, you know, like you, these are the rules, what you tend to see is children sort of find ways to circumvent. And I would rather have open lines of communication and trust so that we can navigate sort of mistakes that are made um, in decision making. Okay. So seed number three. Parents should be involved in actively regulating access to media. Um, and just I want to emphasize again, we can all be manipulated by media and technology. And this is important for us. As you see, the dad is 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 locked to the phone in that in that depiction there. Um, now, this next part is I'm going to show a clip. I'm hoping you can hear it. Um, and if you've seen my presentations, you've seen this clip before, but I still I'm going to ask you, I'm going to prompt you to think about your reaction to the video as a parent. What comes up for you as you watch the video? Okay.
Sorry, guys, I just uh, JP just told me that you guys can't hear the sound. Give me a sec. Mm. So out of curiosity, uh, just at the chat, can no one can hear the chat, uh, the, the video? No volume. OK, let me see if I could share it through. Give me one sec. I'm going to see. Give me one sec, guys. Bear with me, OK? Um, let me see if there's something I can do. <sighs> what can I do? Give me one sec. You know what I'm you know what I'll do? I'm just going to I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, give me one sec. Let me stop sharing. OK, right now, what are you seeing? Are you just seeing me out of curiosity? No more slides. OK, I'll just describe the video. I'll just describe the video in the video. The young boy falls down and as he falls down, he starts to scream for his mama. He says, mama, mama. And if you notice, she looks to move forward. And try to help him. And he instead of helping him, she lets him navigate his environment. And what the video shows is he starts to hear all the sounds around him. So the the uh, the pot, um, the horses in the uh, outside, the fire burning, and you see him start to explore his environment. So I apologize, you couldn't see the video. I'm curious, did it even without a video, did anyone have a reaction of seeing him on the ground and start to look, walk around and go to the fire? Any reactions? I've started sharing, I can see the chat. Any reactions? Don't be shy, guys. Type in something. <laughs> any any thoughts about if you had, if you were in not clear without sound. So let's see if I can maybe. Uh, yeah, OK, and I think, you know, it's unfortunate because I, whenever I usually run this presentation, this is my first time using Canva to run it. And um, for some reason, it didn't allow me, it didn't ask me about sharing, sharing sound. Let me see if I can do it on the PowerPoint. Give me one sec. Um, Hmm. It's unfortunate you can't see the video. Um, so to where I present from here. Give me one sec, sorry. Mm, I'm not seeing presentation. Okay. Oh. Want to pause it? Go back to the chat. Did you guys could hear? Can you hear that sound at all there? When I started playing that? Still no. Okay, I apologize, guys. So for for whatever reason, it didn't. It's not letting me share the sound. So the point is of, of what I'm trying to get at is that for most of us, when we are uh, when we see our child in that in that moment of distress, we're going to feel distress, right? We're going to feel like we need to save our child. Um, in oh, it was there for a second. Someone said, "You know what? I'll share the video afterwards." <laughs> Yes, I know, I know. You know what? Right now, um, let's see settings. Again, I've done, I do webinars all the time, and I've never had an issue. So this is why I'm a little bit. Um, I'm just going to continue, guys. I apologize. I'm going to continue. I'll share the video afterwards, and then we can, and you can see it there. There, okay. So, so the point is of the, of 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 that clip, though, is that there are many times when we will see our child in distress, and our initial reaction is to save it is human we all will feel that and yet one of the things that's come out in the literature actually is that the more we save the less our child can build resilience okay 
So what is resilience? Resilience is the ability to adapt, bounce back, thrive, despite facing adversity, challenges, or stressful situations. Excuse me. It involves coping with stress, adversity, setbacks, developing a positive coping mechanisms uh, that contribute to an emotional well-being and overall growth. And so I say that to you because one of the things, again, I don't have time to talk about it in complete detail, but there's a program called Supportive Parenting for Anxious Childhood Emotion. For short, it's named SPACE. You're going to see at the end, I'm going to give you a book, a name of a book that I have no royal, I make no money off the book and that's available through the public libraries that will walk you through things like how do you start to build resilience in your children by not always accommodating or saving uh, your child. Um, and so when we're thinking about resilience, one of the things we want to uh, talk about is that it's not a fixed trait. It's not something that you achieve. It's not like it's not like I'm going to get a, 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 a certificate that says you are now graduated as a resilient person. No, resilience is something that's constantly we're constantly working on. It's a dynamic process. You know, there's a lot of variables to it. We're constantly trying to work on our ability to handle scenarios that are thrown at us. OK, and our job as parents, the one thing that we can do if we're going to try to foster resilience in our children is we do that by providing a supportive and nurturing environment. We're teaching that some of the things we talked about, like problem solving skills, we're promoting emotion regulation, and it might start with, again, labeling and noticing, and we're enc encouraging positive relationships. By doing all these things, we are increasing our, our child's ability to be resilient in the face of negative scenarios or situations. So let's talk quickly and we're almost done. So then can we we'll open up some questions if there's any questions, but let's talk about some practical steps. Resilience building. We can support our children to ride the waves of emotion and think about available options during stressful times. Here, what I'm trying to get at is, again, going back to saving our children. When we see a big emotional reaction, things like sadness, Okay, I'll give you an example. Let's let's be concrete. Let's say your your child comes up to you and says, um, "I'm you know I I hate myself. No one likes me." Most of us are going to respond with something like, "Of course, every people like you. Okay, of course people like you, or you're loved, or whatever it is." Okay. When my reaction is to immediately try to get rid of the emotion that my child is communicating without realizing what I'm saying to that my child is we're not going to talk about that emotion because it makes us uncomfortable. And so when we're thinking about how we build resilience and how we uh, start to build self-regulation in our children, this is why we do validate validation. Ah, it sounds like you're pretty sad, huh? You're pretty, you're, 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 you're feeling pretty down. Yeah, sometimes when I'm sad, when daddy's sad, sometimes I think that, you know, life sucks and it's not going to get better. It's pretty lonely sometimes. But, you know, you know, your daddy's here. So why don't we like, you know, hug or do something together or enjoy ourselves, do something again. I am trying to validate that emotion that my child is trying to communicate with whatever they, they came to me with. We're also going to try to emphasize. Remember I said to you earlier, like. Children learn best from how we handle stressful situations. And so I think it's really valuable and sometimes goes against what we teach in Western society is that it's important for us to, to show our children that asking for help is a skill, a, a good skill. Leaning on a support network is something that is a good thing. It is we are a community, right? When you look at your schools, your neighborhood, we are a community. We've lost some of that in, in our, our sort of modern society because we teach about individual handling things on our own, pulling yourself by your bootstraps. I think that there's more value in being able to teach our children that it's OK to say, I don't know how to do this. I need some help. And I can I can I rely on my support network? And then lastly, one of the things that we can and this is going to be in, the, in every school classroom, basically, is the idea of the growth mindset. Right. I'll tell you right now, my older son is the type of guy who gets things easily. However, when he faces something challenging, he's ready to give up. Right. It's the worst thing. I'm the worst thing. I can never get this. And so one of the things we're working on with him is a growth mindset or a developmental mindset. The idea of not yet, the not yet principle. Yeah, you can't do that. Not yet. Anyways. Right. Trying to promote this idea that failure is part of progress. Failure is part of learning. Failure is part of life. 
right? And trying to really promote our, our ability to talk about failure is really important. When we do these steps, what we're doing is we're cultivating a sense of self-worth and confidence in our children. Okay, someone's joining now, okay. <laughs> Um, so finally, let's going back to what I, some of the things I said to you. One of the things I'm try, hoping to emphasize is that we cannot save our children from all difficult experiences and failures. Okay, and this is again going going back to this idea of the space program, supportive parenting for anxious childhood emotions. The more we accommodate, the more we do things like I'll give you an example of what we see at the clinic. Let's say a child is scared uh, to vomit. I've seen families for who won't use the word vomit who won't go to a specific room in the household because that's where the child vomited. They will avoid a restaurant or restaurants in general because last time that's, you know, the child got food poisoning. And so as we do those steps, yeah, in some ways we're saving our child, we're helping them feel better. But in, in another, on the other hand, what we're telling them is, yes, the world is so dangerous that there's no point in trying to step out of your discomfort. Right. And so I really like the space program and it's been around for 10 years. And, you know, uh, when I heard about it and I was actually one of the first trained in the province because it was, it was starting to there was starting to be literature on it. Again, it is such a beautiful program. I will give you the name of a book that will walk you through some of the steps. I, I really it's a really nice concept to start thinking about. How can I start start removing some safety nets that I put in place for my child so that they can start to recognize that they're resilient and capable? And this last step, you know, this last point is something that I tell, you know, I supervise uh, uh, young clinicians a lot, uh, a lot, many of them. And one of the things I try to teach with them, and I say this to parents too, is silence can be golden. Now, I know what you guys are saying, like, yeah, definitely silence, silence can be golden. It's hard to find me, me time or, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is this, if you are ever faced with a scenario where your child is presenting something to you and your initial thought is, oh my God, I don't know how to respond. Or you say to yourself, oh my God, I don't know what the right answer is. I would rather you stay quiet. Empathize, listen, and connect. You don't have to have every answer. Oh my God, I'm, you know, thank you so much for sharing. I'm not sure what, what to tell you, you know, but thank you. And, and I'm so sorry you're going through that. Um, you know, tell me what's going on and how, what can I do to help? Or is there anything I can do to help? We're not trying to solve their distress and trying to make it go away. So if you can start to instill one degree change of, okay, this is a moment where I'm not sure what to say. I'm going to empathize, listen, and connect. Then you're making valuable change in, in helping to develop self-regulation. Um, and so as we work on making our child feel understood and heard, we are, especially when they're distressed, we are helping them to develop resilience. Remember I said to you earlier at the beginning, being helping your child feel understood and heard doesn't mean you have to agree with what they've done. There can still be a, no, you're not allowed to do that part of this in this equation. Okay, and we want to model and emphasize a sense of confidence in your child's ability to handle what comes their way. So for example, in that example, when I start to, let's say I was uh, starting to remove the safety nets for that family who can't go to specific restaurants because you know, the child has vomited and we're getting to the place where we're gonna start to go to a, a, a restaurant, we would say something like, you know, uh, Johnny, today's the night we're going to go to a restaurant and we're doing this because we know you can handle it. And so what we're doing is we're emphasize our confidence in our child to to handle that scenario. And then the last thing is I want you to think about is we always want to celebrate effort over results. And I don't mean like giving everyone a participation trophy. What I mean is when your child is is facing something that is challenging, if we can get them to dip their toe, I'm celebrating that. Because dipping your toe when it's something that's scary can be the hardest, but also the most powerful step that you can take. And so we are going to celebrate effort and trying to step out of your comfort zone. So number four, uh, seed number four, going back to the concept of a one degree change. I really want you to think about 
what is something that we can start doing today that's going to cause meaningful change? I'll give you a scenario, and if I always give this example, but I love it. Let's say, for example, I've been working late nights and I, I feel disconnected from my boys. And I'll, I'll be quick, guys. I, I apologize. I know looking at the time. But let's say I feel disconnected from my boys and I say to myself, you know what? I, I need to connect with my boys. And let's say that Monday comes around and I say to me, I say to myself, today is the day I'm going to start connecting with my children. And imagine that I get home. I take my cell phone. I put it on the kitchen island. I sit down on the couch and I call my youngest, Oscar. And I say, Oscar, come over here, buddy. And he comes over to me and I look him in the eye and I say, hey, buddy. Tell me what happened today. What what you do? And and I spend a minute asking him about his day. Okay. In that moment, the phone is gone. Nothing exists but my son. Let's say I spend a minute talking to him, and I say, "All right, that sounds exciting." I give him a little hug. I give him a kiss, and he he leaves. Okay. I do that on a Monday. I come and I do it on a Tuesday. I do it on a Wednesday. I do it on a Thursday, and I do it on a Friday. And I repeat: second week, third week fourth week. What I have done is I've taken one baby step, put my phone away. I spent a minute with my child asking them about their day. Nothing else exists in that moment. And in that moment, as I repeat it, I'm creating meaning. All of a sudden, my son Oscar, 10 years down the road, someone says, hey, tell me about your dad. He might say like, you know what? He used to do this thing, right? And so I want you to think about the big changes don't have to be the result of huge steps small little things something like every friday night we're going to start to have a half an hour time of no technology and the family sitting down to do play cards it might be awkward it might be weird uh, the first friday the more you do it the more you create meaning okay um and going back to what i said earlier parenting is a process right we're going to fail we're going to have bad days um, as long as we can increase our ability to stop every so often and notice why am i making this decision as a parent it's going to improve your parenting OK, so small, incremental, but meaningful change. OK, so again, I'm going to share I'm going to share these like I, I uh, maybe I'll, I'll send it to Mr. Gelozzi, but I'm going to send the presentation and then you guys will have access to it and he can share it with the principals who who shared the links and and are, we'll find a way to share the, the presentation with you. Here are some of the resources, though, the Breaking Free of Child Anxiety and OCD is uh, by Ellie Leibowitz. He's the creator of the space program. Very beautiful book. Uh, you know, Dan Siegel is a great name if you want to look up just child development um, and Ross Green is another big name. Ross Green talks about skill deficits. So often, rather than thinking about misbehavior as being a choice, think about it as a child showing you that they, they're incapable of handling the scenario. Um, again, you're going to have access to this. Uh, oh yeah, Media Smarts is there. So there's Media Smarts. It's a great sort of uh, website. Emotion focus, all of these, these, the second and third links are going to be about validation, teaching your uh, how, uh, parents how to validate. Um, the Mental Health Foundations, actually, the third one has free modules for parents. So you can go on their website and you can start to do the free modules about how do you validate emotions. And then the last one is a free parenting program. Alan Kasdan is one of the biggest names in parenting, and he has a free program for parents on his website. So you can look at that. Um, and, and maybe I'm, I'm going to stop sharing, but here's um, here's my contact information. Please feel free. A couple of things. If you want a presentation at your local school, let me know. We'll we'll see. We'll we'll make sure we cross all our check off 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 all boxes for the school board. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll I'll try to help. If you have questions about resources or supports, feel free to email me, Dr. E. Rolden at etobicopsych.com. And if you want to follow on in, on Instagram, EPS underscore Family Health, um, we obviously we often put well content on our on our social media. Um, and so that's my, I'll leave this up for a little bit and then I'll probably stop sharing and see if anyone has any questions that they want to pose in the Q&A. Um, and if not, then, you know, well, we could end. But uh, so here I'm going to stop sharing. Any questions, any comments or questions? Um, Thank you. I appreciate you. <laughs> any other any comments or questions or anything else you guys want to say? I apologize about the video. I will send the video and I'll try to improve for next time. Yeah, so no questions, anyone? 
again, thank you everyone. Thank you, Mr. Gelosi, for your support. Um, and and I, you know, the other thing is um, the, the video is recorded. What I will do is what we tend to do is we trend to block names. So like when, when we go, because what I'll do is I'll block names so that people can see who signed in and then I'll share that link. If you want to look at the video again, um, it's going to be something that's available to you as a resource. You can also go, I have a YouTube channel that has a lot of past, past webinars on it. Um, and again, our social media, there's a lot of sort of uh, resources that we can offer as, as, a, as a, a clinic. Um, and again, I'm, I love I love doing presentations. I love it. So anyone, you know, reach out, don't hesitate. Um, other than that, guys, thank you. I guess we'll we'll end. Um, thank you again, everyone, for, for coming, and, and I hope you have a great evening. Okay?